This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the only web platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Check out Squarespace through the link in the description below. More about them in just a bit. The old saying goes, follow your dreams. But what happens when those dreams are actively crazy? Do you give up? forget them, or do you press on no matter how many people you destroy? For William Walker, it was always the latter. Born in Tennessee, Walker was many things. Doctor, lawyer, newspaper editor. But in his early 30s, he began to dream of something else. Something that should have never been possible. He wanted to become dictator of Nicaragua. The craziest part? He absolutely succeeded. In 1855, Walker led a gang of mercenaries into the war-torn Central American nation. Taking advantage of the chaos, he marched on one of the seats of government, overthrew the rulers, and had himself declared president. And so began one of the strangest periods in Central American history. Recognized by Franklin Pierce as Nicaragua's legitimate ruler, Walker came within a hair's breadth of turning this foreign land into a vassal state. That he failed is almost entirely down to chance. Famous in his lifetime, almost forgotten today, this is the story of William Walker, the Tennessee boy who became Nicaragua's dictator. From the moment of his birth on the 8th of May, 1824, in Nashville, Tennessee, William Walker's life was saturated with military history. His grandfather had been an officer in the Revolutionary War. Other relatives had taken up arms in the War of 1812. From a young age, the boy grew up hearing tales of the call to arms and battlefield glory, an upbringing that likely influenced his later career. We say likely because little is known about Walker's childhood. However, we can infer things like the probable effect of having veterans in the family. Like the effect of having an invalid mother. A childhood prodigy, Walker graduated from university aged only 14. Immediately, he threw himself into studying medicine with such a zeal that some think it was a direct result of seeing his mother's daily health battle. Whether that's true or not, something clearly motivated him. By age 19, he was a qualified doctor with experience working in Europe already under his belt. But whatever force had pushed Walker to become a doctor was about to come crashing up against an even more powerful side of his personality. William Walker was a man who constantly craved change. By 1845, a year after qualifying, Walker had dropped medicine, moved to New Orleans, and started practicing law. Within another two years, it again upended his life, this time opening an idealistic newspaper known as the Crescent. There, Walker managed a brush with literary history, first hiring a young Walt Whitman, then firing him over his anti-slavery views. Not that Walker was particularly pro-slavery, at least not yet. In his Louisiana days, the young prodigy seems to have absorbed the prevailing views on race, but without ever owning slaves himself or supporting the South's peculiar institution. As we'll see, that stance would soon change in the most cynical way imaginable. But all of that is in the future. For now, Walker settled into his New Orleans life, running his newspaper, becoming engaged to the deaf-mute Ellen Martin. Maybe this could have been enough. Maybe had things gone well, he could have settled down, stopped his wandering, and lived a boring and happy life. Sadly, we'll never know. In late 1848, a cholera outbreak swept New Orleans, killing thousands. Among the dead was Ellen Martin. His fiance gone, Walker quickly reverted. Rather than stay in Louisiana, he made his biggest change yet. The same year, cholera hit New Orleans like a disgusting, poopy missile. Gold had been discovered in California. Now Walker joined the tide of humanity flooding west. An anonymous 25-year-old swept along by a river of prospectors, gamblers, drunks, and con artists, eventually landing where all the freaks land in San Francisco. By now, Walker had grown into a man of slight build, standing only at five foot two and weighing 120 pounds. Yet he possessed an otherworldly charisma far greater than his stature. Maybe it was his clothing which brought to mind a wandering preacher. Maybe it was his soft voice, rarely raised above a whisper. Or maybe it was the eyes, grey, intense, seemingly able to peer into your very soul. Whatever its source, this strange charisma would soon send hundreds to their deaths. Initially, though, Walker's new life in San Fran was similar to his old one in Louisiana. Taking over as editor of the Herald, he made a name for himself reporting on corruption, which briefly got him thrown in prison, and he got into duels with his rivals. One with a trained marksman named William Hicks Graham nearly killed him. From ten paces, Graham blew a chunk out of Walker's thigh, leaving the young man so badly wounded that he needed months to recuperate. It was while laid up that Walker's desperate desire for change caught up with him again. Only this time, rather than simply move city, he got it into his head to do something far crazier. 
he decided to invade Mexico. As an ordinary person, you're probably now wondering, how do you go from, man, I need to change my life, to, Arriba! Let us invade Mexico! To understand this mental leap, we first need to get to grips with a bizarre phenomenon, filibustering. Today, an arcane practice of congressional procedure, filibustering in the 19th century meant something much wilder, using mercenaries to conquer or annex neighboring countries. Back in 1845, the term Manifest Destiny had summed up America's seemingly God-given mission to stretch from sea to shining sea. This ideology had been used to justify endless expansion west, the annexation of Texas, the seizure of swaths of Mexican territory at the end of the Mexican-American War, but not everyone was content to interpret Manifest destiny solely as a westward drive. Others felt it was America's role to conquer the entire continent, a role the federal government seemed unwilling to fulfill. Hence the rise of the filibusters. If the US wasn't going to expand itself, the filibusters would do it for free, launching expeditions into sparsely populated regions and conquering them with private armies. Since most filibusters were from the South, many had the additional motive of founding new slave states. Slave states that could then be admitted to the Union, giving the South an inbuilt advantage. But not all were so ideological. Some were less concerned with manifest destiny than they were with simply setting up their own little squalid kingdoms. Somewhere between these extremes stood William Walker. From his arrival in California, Walker had been a Manifest Destiny cheerleader, demanding Uncle Sam annex Cuba. By 1853, he had gone beyond wanting to just write about it. He wanted to join in. But with Cuba a really long way away, he settled on an easier target. That summer, Walker traveled down to Sonora, Mexico, the vast state that sits below what is now Arizona. Today, Sonora has a population of nearly 3 million people. In 1853, though, it was a wild frontier, thinly garrisoned by Mexican troops and home to hostile Native American tribes. At the Mexican garrison in Guaymas, Walker put forward a simple proposition. In return for the flights to found an American colony in Sonora, he and his men would take Take down the Apaches. To which the Mexicans basically replied, No thanks, we tried that with Texas and eh, look how it worked out. The garrison had correctly divined that Walker's whole plan was to set up a colony, let it grow, and then use his numerical advantage to kick the Mexicans out and annex Sonora. But Walker wouldn't give up. Returning to San Francisco, he set up an office and began selling bonds and land scripts for what was then called the Republic of Sonora. He also began recruiting men, men willing to travel south to help forge this new republic with bullets. By fall, he had assembled a group of mercenaries, nearly 50 strong, a mix of veterans from the Mexican-American War, and failed gold prospectors, all in need of cash. All looked set to go. All of which point, Uncle Sam glanced over and pretty much demanded, What are you dang vomits up to now? Filibustering, you see, was hella illegal. The 1880 Neutrality Act expressly forbid the practice, and Washington was keen to reset relations with Mexico after the war, not let a bunch of dummies provoke a second conflict. That October, the US military caught wind of Walker's plan and confiscated his ship. But in the end, Uncle Sam's interference didn't change a thing. Walker simply found a new ship, the Caroline. On October 16, 1853, he and his recruits set sail under the cover of darkness in the direction of Baja, California. Before three weeks had passed, they'd have conquered the entire peninsula. Now, just before we continue with today's video, a quick word from today's oh, wonderful sponsor, Squarespace. Look, it's the age of creation. Think about it. Everyone is out there on the internet making something. We're no longer just reading blogs or listening to podcasts or watching YouTube. We're increasingly making these things. So you've probably either got a great idea yourself or you know someone who does. And when it's time to move that project from your head to the screen in front of you, that's where Squarespace comes in. It's the perfect web tool to help you fashion the internet into whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're the hands-on type. Lots of opinions opinions and ideas about exactly what your site should look like. Great! Squarespace got all the customization tools you could ever want with no technical BS to worry about. Or maybe you just need something functional, something that works with minimal thought so you could focus on your content rather than just the coat of paint. If so, good news, Squarespace has tons of beautiful templates that you can use. And once you're done setting up your website, there are many extra features on Squarespace so your site can thrive. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support, everything you could ever want is in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next big project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, 
you gotta do it with Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com forward slash biographics, and you'll save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now back to it. From the moment Walker and his first independent battalion landed, God seemed to be on their side. They quickly captured the Baja capital, taking the governor hostage. They then hoisted a flag and declared a new Republic of Lower California. And just like that, Walker had become president of his first country. Now, it's important to emphasize just how sparsely populated northern Mexico was at this time. The garrison Walker had taken down was minuscule, not some vast army he had overthrown with superior tactics. Still, such details hardly mattered. When news of the expedition hit San Francisco, people went nuts. In newspapers, the annexation was talked about as a done deal, another prime example of manifest destiny. Soon, another ship bearing 230 fresh recruits had set sail for the new republic, many lured by one simple promise. Walker had legalized slavery. Walker made establishing the institution a priority, a cynical ploy to shore up support at home. That done, he established his capital at Ensenada, declared himself president, and set about consolidating his gains. When a small Mexican force counterattacked in December, his mercenary army was able to drive them back. For one glorious shining moment, it seemed as if they were on the path to victory. Then the captain of the Caroline suddenly deserted along with his ship and all of their supplies, and that shining moment turned to the color of deepest doo-doo. And that Mexican governor they'd arrested, while locked up on the ship, had apparently said something to the captain along the lines of, you think those bozos pay well? Take me to the Federales, and you'll see what a real reward looks like. Just like that, Walker and his men found themselves stuck with no food, just a new ship carrying 230 excited, hungry men. So, the army did the only thing they could. They foraged for supplies. This being a lonely peninsula, foraging meant raiding random ranches and making off with livestock. This had the effect of turning the ranchers from dudes who didn't care about Walker's antics to dudes who were extremely interested in hiring bandits to kill him. But rather than retreat north, Walker decided to set his sights even higher. In January 1854, he declared the annexation of neighboring Sonora. Doubtless this came as a surprise to the region's residents, since Walker hadn't taken a single town yet, and nor was he likely to. As food supplies dwindled and their leader's megalomania grew, more and more of the fresh recruits were deserting. The worst came when 50 men left at once, after Walker threatened to shoot anyone who didn't swear an oath of allegiance to him. Still, the man from Tennessee wasn't one to give up. On the 13th of February, he left 20 men guarding the village of San Vicente. Then he launched his invasion of Sonora. What followed was a harsh lesson in inflated expectations meeting cruel reality. Those bandits the ranchers had hired now began a sustained assault on Walker's ranks, killing men by the dozens. The 20 men garrisoned in San Vicente were all murdered. Others died of illness. Finally, with just 33 soldiers left alive, Walker belatedly realized the jig was up. Rather than go down fighting, the president of the Republic fled for the safety of America. Crossing the border on his 30th birthday, Walker was immediately arrested. That October, he stood trial in San Francisco for violating the Neutrality Act. It should have been a slam dunk for the prosecution. Walker was guilty as sin. The fact that he chose to defend himself should have just been the icing on this increasingly mixed metaphor. But we're forgetting one crucial detail. This was the era of Manifest Destiny, when nearly the whole of society society believed in America's God-given right to expand, hence the jury taking only eight minutes to deliver their verdict. Not guilty. William Walker strolled free that day, a hero to the American public, but rather than just soak up the celebrity, he would soon have his cold gray eyes set an even greater prize, Nicaragua. The 1848 gold rush had exposed a stark truth. California was really, really hard to get to. Rather than simply jumping in a car and hitting the interstate, you had to either do a dangerous overland journey or a dangerous sea journey around the bottom of South America. Either way, it took months. At least it did before Cornelius Vanderbilt got involved. One of the richest men in America, Vanderbilt divines that he could make a killing ferrying people between Nicaragua's coasts, thereby cutting travel times to California to the bone. In 1851, his accessory transit company became a money-spinning machine doing just that. There was just one problem. Nicaragua was in a state of constant civil war. Split between the conservatives in Granada and the liberals in Lyon, Nicaragua had descended 
splintered into bitter partisan factions who hated each other more than they hated outsiders. To get his transit system built, Vanderbilt had relied on the conservatives inadvertently chucking them a helping hand. So the liberals decided to play their own dodgy cards. In 1855, they asked William Walker to help them win the war. Once again bored, once again looking for change, Walker readily agreed. He rounded up a gang of 57 mercenaries whom he dubbed the Immortals and they set sail on May the 4th. But the grey-eyed man of destiny had bigger plans than simply helping the liberals. In his words, Nicaragua is a country for which nature has done much and man little. A land of opportunity, ripe for exploitation. All he had to do to grasp it was definitively win the war. Landing on June the 16th, Walker's forces were supplemented by an additional 200 Nicaraguan liberals. As one, they marched on the conservative stronghold of Rivas, a key link on Vanderbilt's transit route, sure a victory. It was a feeling that lasted right until the conservatives started shooting. Despite coming from a family of veterans, Walker was no military man. For the Battle of Rivas, his entire strategy was basically just walk in there, we guess. They'll probably just surrender. Instead, the Rivas garrison made mincemeat of them. Walker's Nicaraguan troops fled, his immortals were pinned down, forced into fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting. By the time they broke out, eleven not quite so immortals were dead and five were wounded. Rivas hadn't even come close to falling. For liberals who'd hired him, the aftermath must have been the most brutal case of buyer's remorse in recorded history. By rights, this should have been the end of their partnership. But with no other cards to play, they allowed Walker to stay on, and good job too, because the great filibuster was about to pull off his most audacious move yet. The thing with the Battle of Rivas was that it had been so one-sided that the conservatives were now sure that they were untouchable, so nobody in their capital of Granada was on guard against a serious threat. A threat like, say, Walker commandeering one of Vanderbilt's steamships, filling it with troops sailing across Lake Nicaragua and invading Granada from the waterfront. The surprise attack on Granada was, well, surprising for everyone in more ways than one. Overwhelmed and underprepared, the conservative elite had no choice but to surrender on Walker's terms, and those terms showed the true nature of his plans. Under the truce, the conservative army was disarmed and the liberal army disbanded. In their place rose a new, more powerful force, the United Army of the Republic, under the control of newly promoted General William Walker. And while there would be a coalition government and a new president, there would never be any doubt about who was really in charge. From now until his downfall, Nicaragua would be firmly under the thumb of the boy from Tennessee. The following months were an era of disbelief. Back in the United States, Walker became a folk hero, praised in newspapers as the gray-eyed man of destiny. A successful recruitment drive brought more colonists. Plays were written about him. In spring 1856, President Franklin Pierce even recognized the Walker regime as Nicaragua's legitimate government. Unlike the Sonora debacle, it seemed this adventure had permanently transformed geopolitics. But even as Walker felt himself an undefeatable god, forces were already massing against him. Out on the coast, the British Empire was starting to worry about this American presence in a region that they had interests in. Closer to home, the other Central American nations were starting to give Nicaragua nervous, sidelong glances, worrying if this was just the start of Uncle Sam coming to sweep them all up into his greedy arms. The first tremors came in February 1856. That month, Costa Rica declared war on Nicaragua. Before they could attack, Walker led a preemptive strike on Santa Rosa, only to be defeated in just 14 minutes. By March, the Costa Ricans were marching on Rivas. Again, Walker went to fight. Again, the Costa Ricans handed him his arse on a platter. Once again, though, Walker's luck somehow held. After taking Rivas, the Costa Rican army was devastated by a cholera outbreak. Unable to chase Walker to his capital and kill him, they returned home. But this was just a stay of execution. By June of 1856, a combined force from Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala had invaded, capturing the liberal stronghold of Leon. When the Costa Ricans also returned, the nerve in Nicaragua's puppet government collapsed. The president fled for his life, denouncing Walker as he went. In the wake of his departure, Walker held a sham election and had himself elected to the post. On June the 12th, the bands marched through Granada's colonial streets, playing Yankee Doodle Dandy to celebrate the inauguration. It was vintage Walker, puffing up, overconfident, and not a little silly. It was also followed by a selection of his greatest hits. As President Walker legalized slavery, encouraged mass migration from the USA, made English the official language, and laid the groundwork for future annexation by Washington. Yet, that annexation would never come. 
Even as he made his grand pronouncements, Walker's regime was crumbling. El Salvador's army was on the march. The British were now supplying weapons to Costa Rica. But the killing blow would be struck by a single man. Up in the US, Cornelius Vanderbilt was livid. Livid with this punk-ass filibuster who'd destabilized Nicaragua, commandeered his steamships, and handed the charter for the crossing to a business rival. In fact, Vanderbilt was so livid that he began shipping weapons and money to Costa Rica, sending mercenaries south. By November, Vanderbilt's agents had recaptured all of his steamships, leaving Walker cut off from reinforcements. As the Costa Rican army closed in, Nicaragua's president did the only thing he could do. He ran. That month, Walker put Granada to the torch, burning the colonial city so completely that all that remained was a sign reading, Here was Granada. He and his immortals then marched out to Rivas, where they were surrounded. And so the Walker regime ended, not with a bang, but with a drawn-out siege. A siege that only lifted on the 1st of May, 1857. That day, a U.S. warship brokered a truce, allowing Walker to leave Rivas, be arrested, and taken back to the U.S. to stand trial. Hours later, President Walker left Nicaragua for the last time. By this point, it had been the nation's official leader for a mere 10 months, a strange blip in its long and tortured history. But as far as Walker was concerned, it wasn't over. He was certain that he'd be back to reclaim his country. The end of the Nicaragua debacle played out like a half-assed reprise of the end of Walker's Mexican adventure. Just like last time, Uncle Sam put him on trial for violating the Neutrality Act. Just like last time, he was acquitted by a jury that spent the whole trial making love hearts at him. This was followed by months of celebrity as he toured the South making speeches in which he blamed the military failures on northern abolitionists. He also got to meet President James Buchanan. There were yet more plays about him, awful poems. One representative example runs, It needs not a prophet or talker to tell you in prose or verse the exploits of Patriot Walker, whom tyrants will long deem a curse. A brave son of freedom is Walker, and nations his fame will rehearse. And yes, if you're wondering, possibly every English lit major on earth just vomited a little into their mouths. Walker became so celebrated in this period that he was able to raise enough money for another round of filibustering. Setting sail in late 1857, the grey-eyed man of destiny this time aimed for his old enemy, Costa Rica, only for the US Navy to capture him, bring him back, and once again put him on trial. And would you know it, once again he walked free. By now, the filibustering was like a record stuck on repeat. 1858 saw another army raised, another expedition launched, and another ignominious round of capture and return to the US. Yet as 1859 dawned, there were already signs that the nation was moving on. Once tolerant of Walker's escapades, President Buchanan now denounced him. Where it once been fated across America, Walker was now only welcome in the deepest of the Deep South. Yet he still couldn't break the cycle. Never able to sit still for long, still deluded enough to believe God wanted him to rule Nicaragua, the boy from Tennessee was by now trapped in an endless repeat performance. A cursed actor, doomed to go through the motions of a predictable play for all eternity. Well, almost. That summer, 1859, Walker again set out for Central America, this time landing in Honduras. But while it would once again be captured, this time there'd be no trial in America, no friendly jury eager to see their hero stroll free. No, this time there would at last be something like justice. After briefly taking the city of Trujillo, Walker and his men were arrested by a British naval fleet, annoyed at this American once again threatening their colonial interests. Rather than take him home, the commander handed Walker over to the Hondurans, this time, the court returned a sentence shocking in its finality. On September 12, 1860, Walker was led from his cell, tied to a chair, and shot by a firing squad. He was 36 years old. The deed done, the Hondurans refused requests to return his body to America. Instead, his ceremonial sword was sent to Nicaragua, a morbid gift of friendship. Nowadays, William Walker's exploits are mostly forgotten. Even a 1987 biopic starring Ed Harris couldn't save him from oblivion. In many ways, that's probably what he deserves. For all his conquest of Nicaragua was pretty remarkable, it lasted less than a year. In all other military endeavors, Walker was a mediocre leader at best, too sure that God was on his side to bother with tricky things like planning and strategy. And yet, for all that, there are ways in which his story remains worth knowing. A product of his time, Walker was almost like manifest destiny made flesh, a strange icon of a strange time when people believed the US should absorb the entire continent. His name may be obscure now, but the lessons of his life remain relevant to this very day.